everyone. Happy April Fool's Day. This is Darius Aria coming to you from Rome, and we're going to celebrate April Fool's Day by reflecting on jokes, pranks, and laughter in ancient Rome. What kind of sense of humor did the Romans have? What were typical jokes? Let's delve into the world of comedy, satire, graffiti, and art. And what we're going to be doing is we'll be having a series of images behind us, and those images will be of many emperors, and then, because we'll hear, hear from some of them in their own words, and then lots of images from Pompeii. Why? Because when we think of graffiti, and we're going to hear some of the famous graffiti, it usually comes from Pompeii. So some fun images like this glass bowl with fruit come from Pompeii. There's a great image of Pompeii. So I hope you guys are doing well. Hope your kids are going to be maybe zoning in and out a little bit. And uh, I will keep it clean for a lot of the jokes. Oh, there are so many great jokes. So many. I mean, let's face it. When we do take a look at poetry, when we do take a look at the uh, witty comments, when we look at satire, which you can say the Romans uh, invented, boy, oh boy, they can be R-rated, restricted, vulgar, raunchy, and definitely hilarious comments by the Romans. So already from the get-go, um, sure, the world was different back then. Sure, uh, there was slavery, there were gladiatorial games, there were all kinds of things within society that we don't have today. But human nature, I feel that we can pick up those books, we can look at those texts, even in translation, and we can feel connected to the lives of the Romans through their tombstones, through their graffiti, through their histories, through their poetry, through their satires. And that's what really, I think, can connect us to uh, their realities, their tough lives, their successes, their failures, and of course, their love of humor. So we're gonna hear from a couple of different sources. I'll just run through those. One uh, collection of aphorisms or maxims, uh, is collected into a grouping called Apophegmata. So you will have a couple of those collections of sayings, oftentimes witty and funny, that we'll get into. Um, we're also going to have moral sayings, proverbs, uh, sententiae they're known as, dicta, the sayings of, so the sayings of the emperors. So we're going to hear from in the words of Tiberius, in the words of Vespasian, and so forth. So that's why I have a lot of these emperors behind us here from various museums. Most of what you'll see will be from the British Museum, and then here you're seeing a lot from the Archaeological Museum in Naples. Magnificent examples. Here's uh, Claudius, we'll hear from him as well. Let's just jump right into it. Uh, one of the funny things that's, I'd say, garnered a little bit of attention in recent times is the Scriptorae Sistorae Augustae. These are writers writing about the later emperors, like Septimius Severus behind me, and one Emperor, I didn't actually put an image of him up, Elagabalus, he is credited with what one scholar calls a whoopee cushion. So I figured, you know, practical jokes and pranks, why not uh, cut right to the chase? But what we have here is uh, this story that when Elagabalus would have dinner parties, he would uh, invite his guests to go to uh, dine with them and they'd sit on, remember the Romans didn't sit in a table and chair for meals, they'd recline on large triclinia couches. So what he did was he'd have his big cushions, instead of them just being like pillows stuffed with feathers or whatnot, he had them filled with air. And then in the middle of the meal, he had the air let out and all the guests would boom collapse and fall onto the ground. And Elagabalus thought this was really funny. It's something that he created to uh, just play around with his guests. So, you know, some people want to call it a whoopee cushion. I mean, it's just a practical joke to play uh, on your friend. It's like you have your guests come over to your house, you're doing a sleepover, maybe your kids are having a birthday party. You pull out the uh, inflatable mattress, and then maybe someone to pu to pull a joke on the uh, other kids in the middle of the night, psh, lets out the air, something like that. So I think that it just shows you right off from the get-go that Romans are like us. Romans have 
can have a fun sense of humor, can have a cruel sense of humor. Uh, and when we start to look at these tales of the Romans, uh, we'll see that uh, they can be just as biting and sarcastic as we can in our say nightly commentary, our, our, our comedy shows and whatnot. So let's see here. Um, well, we can go back to about the second century BC and we can talk about uh, comedies, we can talk about plays, Terence and Plautus namely. We won't have to get into them just today. But I wanna jump right into this issue of epigrams, these fun short poems. And Catullus is famous because he would make fun of a lot of people and including Julius Caesar. And another person who really stands out to me, a person I enjoy reading very much still today, is the poet Marshall, who is alive in the uh, period of the Flavian emperors. And in fact, he writes one whole book of epigrams celebrating the inauguration of the Colosseum. So we'll get to, we'll get to him right now. So here's one thing that he says to uh, Titus with the inauguration of the uh, Colosseum. If you should chance Caesar to come uh, upon my books, lay aside that look which awes the world, even your triumphs, that's this big military parade that a general or an emperor could win, even your triumphs have been accustomed to endure jests, nor is it any shame to a general to be a subject for witticisms. Read my verses, I pray you, with that brow with which you behold uh, Themily, who's a female dancer, and Latinus, the buffoon, or a jester. The censorship may tolerate innocent jokes. My page indulges in freedoms, but my life is pure. So what he's saying also to the emperor this time is free press. And I can give you a hard time. I can even make jokes at your expense, but hey, it's all in good fun. And the emperor's reply comes immediately thereafter. I give you a sea fight, the Naumachias, that is, you know, think about the Naumachias that take place in the Colosseum. I give you a sea fight and you give me epigrams you wish, I suppose, Marshall, to be set afloat with your book. So everyone's trying to have a good time. Everyone's doing things in jest. But definitely Marshall is a person that's going to be poking fun at a lot of people. And he names them. He, he calls them out. So one such person, Diolus. Diolus had been a surgeon and is now an undertaker. He has begun to be useful to the sick in the only way that he could. So he's not saying much of the professionalism, uh, the medical knowledge of this particular doctor. So very little difference between him being a doctor and now being an undertaker. And that's the kind of humor that uh, Marshall is known for. I gotta uh, read another one, to Bassus. Okay, you deposit your excretions. This is a kind of an old translation here. So basically, you go to the bathroom without any sense of shame into an unfortunate vessel of gold while you drink out of glass. So glass is something that was pretty much in vogue. It's nice to have a glass, um, a glass to drink out of made of glass, whereas before, you know, it was more like uh, made out of um, ceramic. The former operation, that is the second, consequently is the more expensive. So he's also giving a, giving a hard time to his friend who's obviously very wealthy and he's talking about you're basically wasting your beautiful gold chamber pot for going to the bathroom. In. How did people, we talked about this before about living life, the, 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 the dirt, the disease, the nitty gritty of how people were getting by in the city of Rome, so crowded, even up to a million people. And here, in fact, is a, is a joke where there's someone who's so wealthy, his chamber pot, just like everyone else in the world is using at the time, but his chamber pot, his bowl for going to the bathroom is actually made of gold. So, you know, Marshall's, Marshall's a pretty decent guy. There are a lot of other authors out there that are much more, um, more harsh. But I think we can have a little more fun uh, with, uh, with Marshall. You do not publish your own verses, Lilius. You criticize mine. Pray cease to criticize mine or else publish your own. So, you know, you're going to give me a hard time that what I write, I've been writing books and books and books of my epigrams. You're saying, is that good? Well, 
You haven't written anything. So, you know, Marshall is not afraid to silence his critics. You complain, Velox, that the epigrams which I write are long. You yourself write nothing. Your attempts are shorter. So I don't know, maybe need a wah, wah, wah kind of, uh, uh, kind of sound in some of these today. But you have to think, again, we need to transport ourselves back into that context. Here's a man who's making a name for himself. Marshall knows the emperor. Marshall's come from Spain. He's done well for himself. And he's going to defend himself. And he's going to single out. And he's going to point fingers at those critics and literally shut them up. So he's having fun. Um, and it's worth keeping that in, in mind. Uh, I felt a little ill and I called Dr. Samakis. Well, you came, Samakis, but you brought 100 medical students with you. 100 ice cold hands poked and analyzed me and jabbed me. I didn't have a fever, Samakis, before, but now I do. So again, looks like Marshall likes to spend a lot of his time poking fun at uh, the medical profession. He obviously hasn't had a good uh, a number of good experiences with them. Last one, we got to have a fart joke. Uh, I know a lot of kids are watching, so let's see if we can get this one. Fabulous's wife, Bassa, frequently totes a French baby on which she loudly dotes. Why does she take on this childcare duty? It explains farts that are somewhat fruity. So the lady doesn't really like kids, but she always likes to hold them because when she's holding the babies, if there's a stink, it must be the baby. But that's just the cover for her own farts. So, okay, we can, we can go down and do a lot of bathroom humor. On that note, let's pass over to some graffiti. And the graffiti, of course, you have the background here. Great images of daily life in Pompeii. There's the heading for our, our little a news piece that's reminding you to come to this uh, seminar. These seminars are all subsequently on YouTube. Please, please, please subscribe to We Dig Rome on YouTube. We're getting a great amount of subscribers. We want more and we're building this up. And we ask you then on that level to participate, to give comments. And uh, we also, in coordinating with our other social media platforms, send us comments send us questions so that we can have more topics like today's topic on April Fool's Day that's appropriate to you guys today at home, wherever you are. Okay, so a couple of fun graffiti from Pompeii. Uh, this one's a, a classic. And literally it is people scratching in various levels of um, capability in writing uh, their experiences, their jokes, their insights. We have wet the bed. I admit we were wrong, my host. If you ask why, there was no chamber pot. So chamber pot, chamber pot, uh, little kids might not get that so much. The idea is you get up in the middle of the night and you have to go to the bathroom, you go to the potty. But in the average Roman house, even the rich people, you didn't get out of your bedroom in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. It was in your room already. And it was just a chamber pot. It was just a pot into which you would go to the bathroom. So this person he scratches it in in a little hotel in Pompeii. And he says, yo, sorry, but I had to go. And there was no room to go. So I just peed in the bed. Sorry. All right. If, uh, let's see. if only similar swindling would dupe you, innkeeper, you sell water and drink the undiluted wine yourself. So basically, you're ripping me off. You're telling me this is water. You're telling me this is wine, but it's so bad it might as well just be water. So back in the day, in ancient Roman time, if you're not familiar, they used to cut the wine. So you have the wine and you dilute it. But he's basically saying, this is a ripoff. It's so diluted, it's water. Another one, uh, and this one gets repeated throughout the city of Pompeii. So it's just like a, a cliche, it's a, it's a trope that gets repeated again and again. It's a wonder wall, so someone's writing on this wall throughout the city, a wall, a wall, you wall, many walls, that you have not yet collapsed with so many cliches 
of writers are you are you bearing are you sustaining so people think they're all so smart and they're writing all kinds of things it's just a wonder from the mass of all that writing you haven't collapsed so this is the kind of thing i think we can get a sense of the humor of the romans and, uh, and and get a little closer to them and they're kind of how everyone is pretty witty and pretty sharp um, another one apollinaris the doctor of Emperor Titus. So this is right at, towards the end of Pompeii. Took a good dump here. Okay, so is it really that individual? Is it really that high status person? But the bottom line is, you know, there are a lot of poop jokes out there. And um, another one right by the Vesuvian gate says, oh, defecator. This is like the gate talking. May everything turn out okay so you can just leave. So uh, many times it's, it's that kind of warning. Like, I mean, I'm living in Rome and we have shops and we have uh, people close their shops with, a, with, a, with a, a grate or whatnot that protects that little business. And oftentimes outside it says, you know, don't park your scooter in front of the car or whatnot. And sometimes people get really frustrated with the realities of the neighborhood and say, please don't pee here, pee somewhere else you know, or curb your dog, you know, clean up after your dog and, and so on and so forth. So that, that kind of humor is going to be, uh, you know, quite uh, common. We have another uh, well-known collection of jokes. They date to the fourth or fifth century CE. And the person's name, whether or not it's a true name, uh, Philologos, is the laughter lover. Um, Philologos. And we got 250 jokes here, and I'm not gonna read them all because uh, it, we don't have enough time. But a couple of jokes, uh, just a couple of jokes. An intellectual is like the, the, the smart guy, the, the witty guy, the professor, you know. Falling sick, had promised to pay the doctor if he had recovered. When his wife nagged at him for drinking wine when he had a fever, he said, do you want me to get healthy and be forced to pay the doctor? So I don't mean really that, wah, wah, wah. Okay, so there's a lot of, uh, lot of jokes like this. Um, a rude astrologer casts a sick boy's horoscope. After promising the mother that the child had many years ahead of him, he demanded payment. When she said, come tomorrow and I'll pay you, he objected, but what if the boy dies during the night and I lose my fee? Okay, so there's some translations by John T. Quinn on the website, Do you I wanna make a note of that as well. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just giving us scenarios of realities that are, are collected. A lot of people probably sat around and laughed at them because they could identify with these realities. Here's one that we're probably not so familiar with. A professional beggar had been letting his girlfriend think that he was rich and of noble birth. Once, when he was getting a handout at the neighbor's house, so a little thing of that. Get, wealthy people oftentimes distribute for, uh, food to the poor. So that's what this guy is doing. So when he was getting a hangout, a handout, sorry, at a neighbor's house, he suddenly saw her. Remember, she thinks that he's wealthy. He turned around and said, have my dinner clothes sent to me. Okay, so uh, finally, uh, a glutton betrothed his daughter to another glutton. Uh, we have food in the background too asked what he was giving her as a dowry, he replied, a house whose windows face the bakery. A man with bad breath, so we gotta have bad breath jokes. A man with bad breath asked his wife, Madam, why do you hate me? And she said in reply to her husband, because you love me. Okay, I have to think about that one. Now, I want to turn a little bit in the remaining time to the issue of dicta. So famous things said by the emperors. We've seen so many emperors flash by here. Let's start with Augustus. So we have this recorded. So Augustus wants to have a new cloak. And the cloak is dyed in Tyrian purple. This is really expensive, really pricey. It's the, it's the color of, uh, of royalty and so forth. 
and it's, but it, it came out too dark. And he's complaining about that. So when he complains about it, the man who saw to the, the, the fabrication of the, of, the, um, of the garment says, hold it up higher in the light. To walk even, uh, so the emperor's response was, he presumed that he would have to walk on the height of the roof, like that high top, so that people could see that he was dressed at the height of fashion. So sometimes, uh, you know, you get a retort, hey, it's so dark, and, um, and probably, that's, that was probably a little, a little lost in translation there, but essentially it's hold it up to the light and it, it won't look so dark. And he says, well, I gotta, I gotta go up like three stories. And then at that point, uh, he's gonna be high fashion because he's physically high. Okay, like I'm not the best joke teller here, but uh, we do have a lot of good, uh, good stories here and a lot of witticisms on the part of the emperors. So when um, Pescinius Niger, uh, uh, the emperor, was asked uh, by his troops, we want wine, in addition to every, all the paint you've given us, he says, why do you ask for wine when I have given you the Nile? So they've conquered Egypt and, right, you, you've got all that water from the Nile. I've given you but so much more than the Nile. The Nile symbolized power, the grain, that was feeding the rest of the empire and so forth. So these guys are pretty, these guys are pretty sharp. Uh, we got a lot of lampoons, a lot of jokes against Julius Caesar about his baldness that he had to uh, respond to. Um, let's jump to, uh, so back to Augustus. Uh, one person was coming to him, begging, you know, like a petitioner, coming to him directly to the emperor, asking for dispensation, but he's so scared that this uh, response from Augustus became a very famous saying, you would think that you were giving a penny to an elephant. So it's just, you know, in the sense, Augustus the elephant, this man trembling little and a penny so tiny. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's things that resonated with the people of the time, but if you try to put it into the realities, maybe, someone's coming to meet a king or a queen or the president and they get so nervous they're kind of fumbling and they, you know, what do you think I am like this this gigantic kind of leviathan like a, like an elephant and just just relax um Vespasian Vespasian has one of the great retorts he finds the treasury pretty much empty he has to fill it up and one thing he decides to do is tax the public bathrooms and his image is coming up just shortly and his his son Titus said hey, this is just wrong people are complaining there there's a spaceship right there that huge statue looks like Lyndon B Johnson and his son Titus says you know people are getting frustrated with this because I think it's the right thing to do and um, so what he does is he pulls out a pile of money takes a coin gives it to his uh, his son and he says do you smell anything and he says no and he says Money doesn't stink. So it doesn't matter where it comes from, money is money. Even if you find it's distasteful, you think it's unfair, you think we shouldn't go to the low levels of, of uh, the kind of services that we provide to the city, well, we're gonna go there. So Vespasian was a pretty funny guy. Another time the Senate approached him and said, they had just vowed to him a colossal statue at public expense. He held out his hand and said, the pedestal is waiting. So Vespasian had a lot of really good comebacks and uh, comments on his deathbed, and, uh, not his deathbed, but on the eve of his death, there are a lot of portents, a lot of omens, a lot of things are happening. There's a, a crack that formed in the mausoleum of Augustus, which is where he's gonna be laid to rest ultimately. But what he says when that happens is, oh, that's Virginia Covina one of Augustus's descendants. When uh, a comet passed by, and you can think for a second, comets passing by, the famous Halley's Comet was identified as being the, uh, the soul of Julius Caesar ascending into heaven. So when a comet passes by toward the end of the life of Vespasian, he is saying, oh, well, that's probably has nothing to do with me. Uh, well, he, he, he jumps at it when other people are saying it's the, his end, and he says, look at all that white hair on the comet. It's called the comet. 
must mean the king of Parthia is going to die. So he's having fun with it. Finally, on his deathbed, he says, oh my, I think I'm becoming a god. And on that note, what's happening on Sunday is we are going to be talking about the deification of the, um, of the emperor. And uh, I jokingly also made reference to uh, Maximus and Gladiator. But there's a way to deify pretty much any loved one of yours. We'll talk about the deification of mortals, but of course the focus will be in the uh, lives and, and in the deaths of the emperors. There's pageantry, there's apotheosis, there's um, a really big, a really big um, celebration that we're going to be able to walk through as well. Yeah, so I, I, just a couple of questions then. Um, how can the air stay inside the pillow? Would, would we use rubber, but what was animal bladder or something? Right, so we know they had inflatable uh, pig's bladders that use as balls, uh, but then the, the anecdote is there, so somehow they figured a way to trap the air and then let it out. I would imagine, right, we have to make a huge thing in leather and seal it with something. Uh, you think about big wineskins and so forth. I mean, they definitely would have had the opportunity that, to, to figure that out. I think, you know, the story is there. There are a lot of other stories. They also said that Elagab was like to freak out his guests by uh, putting them in a room and then uh, later on when they fell asleep, uh, let enter wild animals. Imagine a lion that had been de, you know, defanged and then the, the, the claws around just wandering around the house. That would freak you out. In fact, it freaked out a lot of people that they actually got scared literally to death. Um, so let's see here, I'm looking at some other questions here. So did they celebrate April Fool's Day as, as well? Uh, no, it's something that's uh, much more recent. And I did read that at one point, some scholars as a joke, uh, put something around that said, actually the ancient Romans uh, created it and so forth. They love pageantry. They love their jokes. They like to make fun of people. They like rhetoric. They like satire. Uh, Quintilian and uh, Cicero will be teaching about it. If you're a rhetorician, if you're an orator, if you're in the law courts, laughter, joking, putting down your opponents are all powerful tools at your disposal. Horace is famous for his satires. Uh, he's more mocking. Uh, juvenile in the second century uh, AD, he's more abrasive. He's more sarcastic. He's more pessimistic. If you want to read a biting comment against people, read Juvenile. You can read the Satyricon, you can read the Saturnalia. Uh, so there, there are a lot of things I think that we, we talked about, a lot of great sources. Dip into them in your Latin classes. I know we have a lot of Latin teachers that are watching this. You can also uh, get your students involved and, and discuss humor in the ancient world. If you are just passionate about it, we're always going to have a written write-up that goes along with these on, on a devoted page on ancientromelive.org, so you can go there. Of course, we ask you again to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We Dig Rome. It's the American Institute for Roman Culture's YouTube channel. Please subscribe. Please watch the videos. And for everything that we've been talking about, these emperors, the hills of Rome, the monuments of Rome, even some of the cities of empire are up, all, all for you on YouTube. So please go and explore the playlists, and we'll be filling that out Obviously, ancientromelive.org has more written content, book recommendations. We're on Amazon Smile and so forth. Thanks very much. Look forward to seeing you guys on Saturday for the deification of the Roman emperor.